Well, a very good morning to you. Uh, although every time I've greeted someone outside in the street this morning and said good morning, they've turned around and said it's not really that good. But uh, it's good to have you here and it's good to be able to enjoy the warmth of this place. And we're glad to be able to welcome you one and all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to our worship of God here this morning. And uh, those of you joining us online as well, we're delighted to welcome you to our service, wherever you are, whatever your circumstances, uh, delighted that you're able to share with us in this way. We'd love to have you with us in person, but recognize that's uh, just not possible and pray that the Lord would bless and encourage you through our time shared together. We're going to begin our worship this morning by joining to sing to God's praise, the hymn, Praise to the Holiest in the Height. Let us worship God. bow now together in prayer and before God. Let us all pray. Living God, uh, it's always a delight for us to be able to gather together and draw aside from all the other things that occupy our time and our attention and our energies, all the other concerns that we have, all the fears that we have, all the worries that we have, all the problems that we face and come into your presence and the knowledge that you are indeed that great creator God by whom all things are made, to whom all things belong. And you are indeed the God who rules this world with wisdom, with kindness, with integrity, and with great power. How glad we are that for you, living God, there is nothing that is too hard for you. How glad we are to be assured time and again and in any number of ways that there is in your own holy heart a kindness and a compassion that means you have a care over all that you have made and that you do indeed know each and every one of us and all the range of our circumstances. You know us, you understand us, you care for us. And in that love, you declare you have come to us in the person of your Son to address the deepest needs that we have, to meet us in those needs and in and through your Son, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, to provide for us a way of forgiveness, 
an opportunity to enjoy your renewing work in our own hearts and lives as you remake and restore us. And one day you declare, mean to conform us finally to the very likeness of Jesus and all the perfection of his glory. And how we thank you, living God, that in and through your son, the life that he lived, the death that he died, and in that remarkable, astonishing way that you raised him from the dead and commend him to us as one who is risen, alive, and at work in the world, the one who is king. We thank you for the assurance that even death is not a problem to you. You're able to, to bring your power to bear upon that, to break its hold upon our lives by dealing with what lay at its root and how glad we are, therefore, to gather in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and to bring to you our praise, to rejoice in all that you are, that utterly holy and righteous God, who in compassion and care has provided for us a way whereby no matter who we are, what we've done, we may indeed enjoy your forgiveness, enjoy that new start, and enjoy your presence with us. So would you come by your Holy Spirit, living God, and make yourself known to us that we might be aware of your presence, that we might hear you as you speak to us through the Bible, and that we may indeed know once again the assurance of your love and your care for us in the person of your Son, even Jesus Christ, through whom we ask it all. Amen. When we turn to the Bible to read just a few verses from the Bible this morning to start with, Mike is going to come and read these from Romans. We'll have the words on the screen for you. Good morning. Um, as Jerry said, we're looking at Romans chapter 5 this morning, um, starting to read at verse 12. If you're using one of the church Bibles, you'll find the reading on page 1132 of the church Bibles. So Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. Amen. Great. Thank you. Now, you, you may be wondering, girls and boys, what on earth that is all about. And I thought I'd try and explain to you a little bit what uh, Paul, who wrote that letter, is actually on about there in uh, that passage. We're going to have a think more fully about it ourselves later on. And uh, Luke, you've got your hand up because you kind of know who that is, do you? Do you know who that is? Do you know which team he plays for to start with, Matthew? Man City, yeah, and you, absolutely right, there's the man, yeah, you, you, know, you know your facts, that's right. He's a footballer, okay, and his name is Matteo, uh, Matteo Kovacic, and he plays for Manchester City, and his claim to fame this week is that he was the guy that missed the penalty, which means Manchester City are out of the European um, Champions Cup. Um, because uh, when they played, you know who they're playing? Anyone know who they're playing? Anyone like to guess who they're playing? Um, a Spanish club uh, that always kind of wins trophies and things like that. Yeah, Luke? Real Madrid, that's quite right, to play from Madrid. And uh, they're pretty good. And they drew in, uh, um, in Spain. They drew in Manchester. So at the end of that, when they played extra time as well, it all comes down to penalties. And uh, in that situation, um, it is what, uh, what we kind of call sudden death. Um, because uh, you're not the first guy to blow it, um, then that's the whole team uh, out of the picture. One guy misses the penalty, whole team out of the picture like that. And uh, it happens sometimes in football matches, and uh, some of you are maybe, any of you support Aberdeen here? 
Uh, it's just, uh, this is, okay, uh, you may want to look away at the next slide that we bring up. We'll bring up a picture of the next slide there because that's yesterday. And uh, who, who were Aberdeen playing yesterday? Celtic, that's quite, you, you don't have to kind of say it under your breath or anything like that. It's, you know, it's quite okay to, to say the word Celtic here, um, I think. Um, I haven't got shot yet. And uh, they were playing Celtic at Hamden, semi final, and they play at Aberdeen, score to equalize just before the end of full time. So they played an extra time, another half hour, and Celtic go into the lead, and Aberdeen equalize virtually at the very, very end of that. So it goes down to penalties. And what's that guy's name? Who knows what that guy's called? Yep. Killian Phillips, that's right. That's absolutely right. And poor guy. Oh, dear me. What happened? What happened? Yep. Yeah, he missed the penalty. Um, or you could say he didn't miss the penalty. The goalkeeper saved the penalty, which is just another way of putting the same thing. And as a result, whole team are out of the Scottish Cup. Um, and that's why... Pretty much everyone in Aberdeen kind of looks really sad today because they're out of the cup like that. And it all comes down to that kind of sudden death where it all hinges on this one guy. Um, if, uh, if he misses, then that's the team out of the, the, the competition. And that gives you a little bit of an idea what Paul is on about here because one of the things that the Bible teaches is the way that... Uh, uh, as, as a body of people, our circumstances are determined by the kind of head guy. And so there's a good story in the Bible that helps you understand a little bit about this. And we'll put the, the next picture up and see if you can guess who that is meant to be a picture of in the Bible. Any ideas who that might be a picture of in the Bible? Any ideas? Looks like, yes, Chanel. David, absolutely right. David, who was a shepherd, and he was looking after sheep, and uh, he had to face up to uh, not sheep, not lions, not wolves. Who did he have to face up to? Yep, Hannah. Goliath. Okay, so there comes Goliath, and Goliath was a big, 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 big guy. I mean, huge, massively big. Um, if you were to stand down at the bottom there and look up at me, I would, be, I would be way short of where Goliath would be. I mean, he's huge, absolutely mega big is Goliath, huge good guy. And uh, the way that it was, uh, it was kind of worked out was that uh, uh, the, the army that was set against the people of God was called the Philistines. They had a huge big army. We'll put them on the screen as well. Uh, and they simply put out their champion and said, uh, it's a kind of one-to-one -one sudden death. Whoever wins between our guy, Goliath, and your guy, whoever you want to pitch up there, uh, is the winner. And so everything depended on the one guy. And you can understand that the people of God, they, they kind of thought, you know, after you, you know, ladies first and things like that. Who wants to go out and face Goliath? Answer, no one wants to go out and face Goliath because he's a, a big giant. No matter how on earth you're going to uh, get the better of a guy like that, you don't want to get in the same ring as him at all. And, and David steps up and says, well, well, I'm not that big, but uh, I've got a big God and God is able to handle these things. And so he, on behalf of the whole people of God, he tackles Goliath and he wins against Goliath and the people of God win the victory. And, and that in the Bible is, is a kind of picture that is given to us to help us understand what it is that Jesus has come to do for us. Because there are a lot of things in our lives and our experience that, that we can't handle, uh, that are bigger, stronger, mightier than us, that are giant problems in our world. And in particular, they are sin, the, the capacity we have to, to get things wrong and to go wrong like that, and, uh, and death itself. We don't have an answer to that. And Jesus came into this world to be our champion and to do for us what none of us could do ourselves. And, uh, and the Bible simply says he's beaten death. And so we'll put the next picture up for you. Jesus himself tackling death head on on our behalf. And uh, he, he beat death. He beat the giant. He, he got the victory. And he gives that victory to all who trust in him. Uh, that's the wonderful thing. That's the wonderful good news that we have, that victory of Jesus has been given to us. God knew what the problem was. He knew that the problem is with us, that all of us do wrong and get things wrong and go wrong and go our own way. 
And, uh, and we don't have an answer to that. We don't have an answer to, to death itself, but Jesus has come and provided us with that answer. He is the one who gives us the victory. In him we know forgiveness. In him we know that victory, even over death itself, and he's our champion. And that really is what Paul is on about in this passage here, um, just underlining that although the first head guy, um, Adam, in the Bible, who, who blew it, and therefore, the whole of humanity kind of has blown out the picture with him. Uh, and along comes Jesus to, to start all over again and say, uh, I'm going to start a new humanity, a new people here. Uh, come and join me. The victory is yours. We learn to trust in him. We discover that's the life now that we're able to live. So before you head out to Sunday school and uh, enjoy your time there, we're going to sing again. We're going to sing a song that reminds us uh, that God knew all along that's what the problem was going to be, and he had an answer to it in the person of his son uh, when the Father made us. Let's uh, take the opportunity ourselves to pause and to return our thanks to God in prayer and to bring to God our petitions as well. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we bow in your presence, we do so aware, first of all, of the, the sheer greatness of your own majesty remembering even as we do so that this world that we live in, full of such enormous variety, full of such great beauty, marked in so many ways by a, an astonishing order, 
is your world because you made it. You brought it all into being. You spread out the vastness of the universe. And it is astonishing to us, living God, that in all its immensity, there is nonetheless a recognizable order about it. We thank you that we live in a world and indeed in a universe that is run by a God who is wise, who is good, who is kind, who is strong. And yet we recognize too, living God, that uh, we, have, we have blown it and we have paid the penalty in a world that is now tarnished by our sin, broken in so many different ways. We recognize in the items of news that come our way, the tragedies that there are, the violence that erupts, the tensions that exist, the divisions that are created, the anger and the hostility, the animosity, the cruelty, uh, right across the face of the world in which we live. We see it in the arenas of warfare, whose roots are so complicated that we scratch our heads and wonder how on earth can that sort of animosity, that sort of hurt, that sort of harm, those sort of wounds that have been done to societies ever be resolved and addressed and mended. We wonder how on earth the ongoing conflict in Ukraine is, is going to end. How things in the Middle East with Israel and Gaza and, and all sorts of others uh, on the periphery, about to, to join in, it would seem. And all so complicated. And such a long, long and painful history behind it. Uh, how, we, how we cry out to your living God and, and beg of you that as the, the righteous God who is judge of all the earth, you would be pleased sovereignly to intervene and bring these things to a conclusion. And that's just the arenas of conflict, living God. We recognize that there are any number of places where uh, so many different portions of society suffer under cruel and violent, oppressive regimes and have little in the way of any resource to be able to remedy that themselves. So many who live in abject poverty, so many whose lives and whose communities have been devastated by disasters of one sort or another, and for whom the, the whole prospect of rebuilding in the aftermath of earthquakes and the aftermath of volcanic eruptions and the aftermath of flooding and the aftermath of famine and drought, whatever it may be, the, the whole task of rebuilding seems such a an uh, almost impossible task to address. And we pray, Lord God, for all who in one context or another seek to bring relief, who seek to minister peace, who seek to right the wrongs that there are. We pray that you would help them and prosper them and that you would undertake for those to whom the responsibilities of government are given both locally, nationally, and internationally, and that you'd give them much wisdom, much discernment, much integrity, much compassion as they seek to exercise their responsibilities in the name of countless different peoples. We're aware too, living God, in our own lives, of how broken and flawed this world is, the range of different ways in which we experience the brokenness of that world, in the experience of illness, some chronic conditions that folks suffer from, the debilitating effect of so many illnesses, the struggles that so many have with dementia, the issues that folk have in terms of physical pain and mental struggles, 
emotional difficulties, relational tensions, financial problems of one sort or another. And then the experience of bereavement and loss and that devastating pain that, that simply cuts right through to our hearts and weighs upon us like a, a deep pain and ache that nothing can ease. And we pray, Lord God, for those who are ill at this time, that they may have a very real sense of your own gracious, kind presence with them, even as we remember them before you this morning in our prayers and mention them in our hearts by name. We pray, Lord God, that you would draw alongside them and, and with that exquisite gentleness, lay your hand upon them, that hand that ministers the grace and healing of heaven to them, that they may know that they are not alone, that there's a God who cares for them, who is mindful of their needs, and who will indeed place beneath them his everlasting arms to sustain and to carry them through whatever coming days will bring. We pray for those who've been bereaved, living God, that you would comfort all who mourn with, again, that sense of your presence with them, that they may know that that dark, dark valley of grief and sorrow is not one that they travel alone, but that even in the darkness, you're there. Would you give them that sense of taking them by the hand, leading them carefully, gently through this hard, difficult terrain. And may they be assured, even in the midst of that dark sorrow, of your own love for them, your care for them. Would you enable them to have that deepening sense in their hearts that in your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you have indeed provided for us the one who is indeed mightier even the death itself, that we may learn to place our trust in him and rejoice in all that you have done and all that you have promised yet to do for all who do thus trust in him. And so we bring to you, living God, the needs that we're aware of in our own lives, in our own circles, the needs that we're aware of in the world in which we live, and cry out to you, living God, please have mercy. Meet us in our need. Demonstrate the sufficiency of your grace all over again in one context after another. And we will be glad to give you the praise and the glory for it. And all this we ask with all the unspoken prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Before we turn again to the scripture, uh, we're going to sing. We'll sing the song that uh, will be familiar to some, but we uh, haven't sung really as a congregation before. Um, yet, not I, but Christ in me. And I think Andrew's going to play it over first of all for us so that you familiarize yourself with the tune. It's relatively easy to pick up. It's not too complicated a thing, uh, but we'll play it through and then we'll join together to sing it. Yet, not I, but Christ in me.
Well, before we turn to the Bible passage in Romans chapter 5, uh, let's ask God himself to teach us, to give to us understanding, and to help us see how what's written in the Scriptures applies to ourselves. We come always at this point in our worship to the Bible, uh, believing the Bible to be God's Word, and uh, not just spoken by Him, but through which He continues to speak to us. He knows each of us, knows our circumstances, knows our needs, and He uses His Word to speak life, hope, help, comfort, strength into our lives. And let's ask that He would do just that this morning. Lord our God, we do thank you for this uh, remarkable reality that in the Bible we have nothing less than that which was originally breathed out by yourself, so that even in translation we may have that expectation that through it you will continue to speak with power in a way that illumines our darkness and that invigorates our living breathing life and peace and hope and help into our experience. Direct our minds and our hearts, therefore, to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Give to us by your Holy Spirit understanding as we turn to your Word and enable us to see how that changes our living, changes our experience in a way that will equip and enable us to live out our lives day by day for your own greater glory. And this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, in this uh, this particular passage, there's a sense in which what Paul the Apostle is doing is addressing our minds to what I guess are, in some ways, the two biggest realities in the world in which we live that we we do not have an answer for. Namely, on the one hand, using uh, very short one-syllable words, sin and death. None of us like them, none of us want them, and none of us have an answer for them. That's just the world in which we live. There's a lot of evidence in our own lives, in the lives of those around us, in the life on the wide canvas of the world in which we live. There is there's just constant evidence of the reality of sin. A short word that has that letter I at its center, that's the essence of sin. It is my way of doing things what I want, what I need, uh, me first. I bang in the middle instead of God as the center of our world, the center of our way of living. And as a result, because we're all different, we have different needs, different wants, and so on, uh, it's a world in which there is a lot of violence, a lot of aggression, a lot of tension, a lot of uh, pain, a lot of hurt. There's a lot of harm that is done, both at the macro level and also at the micro level in terms of our own experience, our own lives, our own relationships, and on the grand scale internationally as well. The conflicts that there are, uh, the violence that there is, the destruction that there is, the cruelty, the oppression, the, the need that there is. We, we see that in the world in which we live. It doesn't take much. None of us like it. We, we try this, we try that to kind of remedy it. We try that in our own lives. We, we find in our own lives that despite our best intentions, despite our best endeavors, we still go and blow it in uh, our relationships with others, the things that we think, the things that we choose, the things that we say, the things that we do. We, we blow it time after time and we regret it immediately after. We think, why on earth did I do that? Why on earth did I say that? All sorts of stuff that, that, you know, I can trace it way back into my, my uh, um, life as a, a little boy growing up all the way through my, my uh, infanthood and into the, uh, the kind of teenage years, through my adulthood, time after time after time. I think, well, why, why on earth did I do that? 
That was daft. That was crazy. That was stupid. And all sorts of problems that it created for me, quite apart from the problems it created for other people. And I'm not going to tell you even half of what the things that they, they may have been. That's none of your business. It's between me and the, the Lord. But, but it's there, and it's the same for you, despite your best intentions. You lose your temper. You uh, become impatient. You say something out of turn. Um, things happen, and, and none, of us, none of us particularly like it, but we don't have an answer for it. And it's the same with the reality of death. It is a painful, painful experience being bereaved. It's often hard to begin to put into words the acuteness of that sense of loss, the heartache that is occasioned by the, the absence of one dear to us, a whole catalog of memories that have been built up in terms of the friendship, the love that we've had and shared with that individual, and all of a sudden, boom, they're, they're no more. They're gone. And, and it grates with us all. We, we, we find the experience of being bereaved a, a really hard, hard experience. And we find as, as the years go by that all of a sudden life seems very, very short. No matter how long we live it, it seems very short. By the time you get into the, the kind of latter years of your life, you think, where, where did it all go? It was like just yesterday I was a kind of teenager. Uh, so much so that sometimes even well on up in years, you, you still think of yourself as a kind of 20-year-old when actually you're, you're 40 years further down the line. You are a 60-year-old now, but you, you haven't kind of made that leap and, and time flies by and, and we, we think, you know, we're, we're made surely for more than this. And these two realities are what, what Paul is really addressing in this passage. And so it's, um, uh, it's a passage that, that is, is bidding us try and get our heads around what, what the essence of the situation is and, and to see what God has done in order to address that. And there is really ultimately only one answer that adequately addresses these two realities. Uh, and that is in the person of Jesus. You, you will encounter a whole range of different uh, faiths and religions, but none of them really get to grips with these two realities. Some of them say, you know, pull your socks up and, and make sure you kind of uh, just make a better effort and perform better, and you think, well, that's the problem. I would like to, and I try to, but, but I, I don't manage to do so adequately. I still fall far short. And none of them have an answer to death. All their founders, they're dead. Whatever you may think of their teaching, whatever you may think of what they, they taught and, and the, the pattern, the path that they expounded, they're dead. They're dead and buried. You can go and see their tomb if you want. Uh, just to confirm that reality to you. But that's different with Jesus. He's the one who lived that life of perfect obedience, who stood in our place and bore the consequences of our wrongdoing on the cross and prevailed even over death itself. And I'm with him. I'm thinking, yeah, I, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need your renewing power. And I need that victory over death because I don't have any other answer to that at all. Now, that's what Paul basically is on about in this passage. It is described as, quote, um, it's commonly agreed, this is a quote, commonly agreed among scholars that it is one of the most difficult passages in the book of Romans to interpret. So that's kind of reassuring. Uh, we're going to read it in a moment or two, and have um, see the, the words there on the screen. We're going to read it, and uh, just as you, you read your way through it, and you're thinking, whoa, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a clue what no, all this is about, don't worry, you're in good company. A lot of other people think that as well. Um, it's, it's not easy to get your head around the detail of it here, but if you stand sufficiently far back from it, I hope it becomes clear to you. Uh, when we get to the, uh, the bit and we've kind of read through the passage, I'm going to suggest to you that it, it falls into three main headings, just so you've got a kind of route map through this passage here. First of all, verses 12, 13, 14, Paul is talking about the problem. 
Then in verses 15 through 17, he's suggesting that there is a basic pattern in the way in which our experience unfolds under God. And then in verses 18 to 21, uh, he is setting out the promise of God. So you've got the problem, the pattern, and the promise. That's essentially how we're going to navigate our way through this. We're going to read it first of all and uh, then take it from there. Verse 12 then. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Moses was the one through whom the law came, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. So those verses, you've got the problem, and now having spoken of Adam as a pattern, he goes on, verses 15 to 17, to explain what he means by this pattern. Verse 15, the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, Adam, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So there's the basic pattern. Come back to that in a minute. And then the promise, verses 18 to 21. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, that's the, the, the whole passage, and it's a kind of basic unit there. And there is, there's quite a concentrated line of argument that Paul is making here. Um, but don't be put off by the, the kind of concentrated nature of this argument. I'm going to try and uh, hopefully uh, simplify what Paul is saying for you here uh, under these three broad headings that I mentioned. But the essence of it is uh, simply this, that there are essentially two humanities, there is the, the kind of old humanity. Everyone descended from Adam. And that therefore includes you and me. That's, that's the old humanity. And the experience of that old humanity is one of enslavement and of death. Enslavement, we, we find ourselves in bondage to a pattern of behavior that drags us down and results in death. That's that's just who we are in Adam. That's the one humanity. And over against that, there is a new humanity, God coming in Jesus to do as the new man, the new Adam, as it were, what the first Adam failed to do and live a life of perfect obedience and uh, pay the price of our wrongdoing to provide for us a victory even over death. And so over against the enslavement and death, there is in Jesus, there is freedom and life, free from the guilt of our wrongdoing, free from the power of sin and uh, life being given to us, a life that is new, a life that is abundant, a life that is eternal. And so there are these two humanities. That's essentially what lies behind this. And there's a sense which the whole Bible is, is underlining that. 
the whole way through. So you start with, in Genesis chapter 3, you start with a man and a woman in the garden, and they, they are banished from the garden and put out into the wild, uh, the jungle of a sin-stained world. That's what happens. They were in the pleasantness of the garden. They're removed into the, the jungle of the wild. And then in comes Jesus, and he starts in the jungle of the wild. He has those days out in the wilderness. That's where he is. And his story begins in the wilderness and ends in a garden. He brings the people back. And, and that's the, the change that is constantly being uh, set before us in Scripture. So you find in the book of Exodus in the Bible early on, the people of God are there in the land of Egypt. They are slaves. They don't have an answer to their slavery. They are uh, a people who are oppressed. They're people cruelly oppressed, increasingly oppressed, and they don't have an answer. They don't have the resources to be able to stand against the mightiest empire at that time in the ancient world. How on earth are they going to get out of that slavery? God comes in and he takes them out of that slavery into a new world, into a new land, a better land, brings them into a good, spacious land instead of that, that slavery that they've previously known. And uh, in the New Testament, the, the, the way that often it's put is in terms of God coming to meet us in our darkness, in the dominion of darkness, take us out of that dominion and bring us into the kingdom of his beloved son in which there is life. So that there is this sort of basic picture that he's working with. And he starts in verses 12, 13, and 14 with the problem. Verse 12 is his basic diagnosis. And the diagnosis is uh, under these four basic headings. Number one, sin entered the world. So this is uh, just the, the diagnostic approach to understanding the world in which we live. Sin in all its many forms, that kind of self-centered, self-seeking, uh, self-important uh, uh, facet to our humanity, that's an intruder. That's not part of the way the world was made by God to be. It is an intruder. Uh, don't blame God for it. Uh, not part of his original creation. It came in. Sin entered the world. When you ask, how did sin enter the world? Uh, his answer is, through one man through the, the man who kind of headed up humanity at that time, Adam, uh, in the rebelliousness whereby he figured that, that actually he could make a better job of being God in the world than God himself could. And so uh, he, he chose to, to go against the command of God. God had said, you are free. I have made this world for you. I have made it in all its abundance, in all its plentifulness, all its beauty. I have made this lovely world, this well-ordered world, this world that is full of beauty, a world that is, uh, is uh, furnished with so many good things. Go out, he said, and enjoy that whole world. Enjoy all the fruit of the different trees, enjoy the beauty, enjoy the, the refreshment, enjoy the, 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 the richness of it all. Just go and enjoy it. It's, it's yours, and I've given it to you. Go out and enjoy it. Just don't touch the fruit of that tree there. And, and Adam figured, you know, why not? You know, um, uh, how mean can a God get that he, he, he makes a whole world and says, but don't touch it. And, and so he figures, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go for that. I, I want to be, be the one in charge. I, I want to run my own life my own way. I'll do things my way. And so he, he rebels against the living God. Sin comes in through the one man in that manner. And next stage that Paul points to is, and death came in through it. So sin comes in as an intruder through the one man, Adam, and as a consequence, death also comes in. Because death is, from the very outset of the Bible, it is, um, it is not intrinsic to the way that God does things. It is the consequence of, or the wages of, or the penalty for sin. So it's always put. God said right at the very beginning, the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Like God says, I, I mean it when I say that. And Adam was kind of persuaded that no, God couldn't really mean that. Surely a God who's such a creator, a God who's so kind, a God who's so generous, he couldn't possibly mean that. But God says, yeah, I, I do mean that. The day you eat of that, you will surely die. Don't touch sin. And um, it's always amplified all the way through the Bible. 
that the consequence of sin is always death. That's what it results in. You, you run counter to the, the great author of all life, the God who is good, the God who is kind, the God who is wise, the God who imparts and, and creates life. You run counter to that, then, then you are bringing in death. That's, that's just the consequence of it. And so, death spread to all, he says. And uh, that's the consequence that um, humanity itself was infected and so you have that extraordinary chapter in Genesis chapter 5 that you're inclined to skip over because it's, it's just a whole long list of people's names, you know, and this person gave birth to that person and, this, and lived so many years. And, and running through it is a, a very, very somber refrain. And he died. 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 It spread to all people. As it came in through the one man, it spread to all people. And so what he then goes on to, verses 13 and 14, is essentially to, to um, uh, explain the essence of the disease that there is in this humanity. And the disease is, is simply like this, if we may put it in these terms. If you are a, a Russian agent, I, I should, probably shouldn't say that, if you were an agent from a foreign country, Let's put it like that. <laughs> I'll have Putin on my, my um, shoulders before I know it if I'm not careful. But if you're, you know, wh whatever, you know, you're a foreign country and you want to do damage to uh, the infrastructure of another country, then one good way of going about it is using a nerve agent. Uh, and you just need a, a kind of drop of that nerve agent in the water supply of a community you have contaminated the whole water supply. It may just have been one drop, but now the whole water supply is contaminated lethally. And something like that, Paul is saying, is what happened. When Adam sinned, it was like a, a drop of this lethal agent sin infected the whole of humanity. So everyone bound up with Adam is infected in this sort of way, contaminated in this manner. You could think in terms of a, a, a rogue gene that got into the system. And that just gets passed on in the DNA of humanity. No matter who you are, where you are, um, you are born with that distorted gene in your humanity, as it were. I'm not talking about the, you know, the actual DNA, but uh, um, spiritually speaking, that's the reality. Um, you are contaminated in that way. That, that's very easily demonstrated, the reality of that. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever come across a, a little child that in uh, early years um, starts to bite. We had children like that. They would bite one another. They'd bite me, the dad. I didn't teach them that. I didn't say, listen, I'm going to give you a kind of crash course in, in how to bite as, as a means of defense. They, they kind of knew it instinctively. I, I didn't have to teach them to lash out at uh, other people when they didn't get their own way. I didn't have to give them a crash course on that. So listen, you know, let me teach you a few good moves. You know, so let me teach you a bit of violence here so you, you'll learn how to do it. Come on, you've got to learn how to do it. They did that without anyone teaching them. They just did it because, because they're human. And that's what Paul is on about here. The whole of humanity is now infected with this reality of sin. A death spread to all, and the disease, therefore, is one that um, uh, long before there was, you know, the law of God coming into place, and, uh, you know, uh, people begin to think, surely you, you can't do things that are wrong if there's not a law that says, and, well, they, they do things that are wrong whether or not there's a law, and the, the fact that, that all died and kept on dying all the way between Adam and Moses, where the law of God was being given, that, that kind of demonstrates, yep, yeah, it's in the system. Uh, the problem is already in there, the, the reality there that the whole of that humanity has been infected. And so he speaks about Adam there, you'll see at the end of verse 14, as a pattern of the one who was to come. So that there is a sense in which what happens 
with that humanity through the one man, Adam, is a pattern for what God himself will then do in the new man that he's going to send into this world, even his own son, Jesus, becoming one of us and born uh, to Mary uh, that we celebrate at Christmas. So he moves on then to the pattern in verses 15 to 17, Adam, a pattern of the one who is to come. Okay, you with me so far? Uh, Hopefully. All right, we've got a a humanity here. Sin came in, it's the intruder, through the one man, Adam, who was kind of head of the human race at that particular juncture in time. And uh, and it uh, brought with it death, and death spread to all because the whole of humanity is now infected. Uh, the whole of humanity with this kind of dud spiritual DNA, with that, that uh, rogue gene in our spiritual DNA called sin, and therefore all experiencing death. We've got a problem because we, we can't fix that. So God uh, has a, an answer to that in the person of Jesus. And so in these verses, 15, 16, 17, um, there is uh, one of these kind of classic things you probably got at school, um, if you went to school which presumably most of you did, Um, a kind of compare and contrast. Um, You ever done that exercise at school? Some of you probably have done that, and and maybe you don't remember it, but you probably did it, a compare and contrast, where you've got to look for the similarities, and you've got to look for the differences between those, and and it's a compare and contrast thing that is going on here. And the, the comparison is between Adam, who is the head of humanity, so that what is true of him becomes true of everyone in that humanity, and Jesus, the head of a new humanity, and everything that is true of him, true of all those who are in him. So you see where it's kind of leading. You're either in Adam because that's where you were born, or you're in Christ because you have, you have shifted by the exercise of faith into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You're part of that new humanity. That's the basic pattern. Everything that is true of the, the kind of one head guy becomes true for all those who are in him. Now, that's uh, how he starts off the comparison there in uh, uh, these verses. We're all in Adam. And so we are um, part, I suppose, you could think of it like this, we are part of the Adam's family. Now, the the kind of Adam's family that uh, you saw on the the TV screens, um, I think they started back in 1964. They, they, They spell with two Ds in the middle, the Adam's family. And um, quite interesting, it uh, was a cartoon by uh, a New Yorker that, that actually originated in, in uh, America in the 19, late 1930s, I think, um, the Adams family. And uh, you're not kind of weird family. And in the, the television series, uh, the uh, Mrs. Adam, she gets given a, a name, a, a first name. And interestingly, her first name is Morticia. You remember that? Maybe you don't. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm just telling you. You can check it out for yourself. She's called Morticia, which, which is from the Latin word for death. And here the Adams family, the matriarch who kind of heads the whole thing up and, you, you know, her who must be obeyed type of thing. You don't argue with, uh, with this lady, Mrs. Adams. No, she's called Morticia because right at the heart, the one who generates the rest of the family is death. Uh, interesting comparison. That's, that's who you belong to. You're part of Adam's family as your starting point. And um, you don't need to be a celebrity to be, to be wanting to say, listen, uh, I'm a celebrity. Get me out of this family. I, I don't want to be in this family. I don't want to be a family that is tainted in this way, that is contaminated in this way, that is marked by death in this way, but I'm stuck here. Get me out of here. And that's the, the kind of comparison. But the, there is another humanity alongside that of Adam's family, there is Jesus' family. And so the the contrast and comparison through these verses between the Adam on the one hand as the head of one humanity and Jesus as the head of another humanity in that manner. And I can appreciate those of you sitting over this side are beginning to get a kind of complex that uh, you're on on the the kind of Jesus side and you're on the Adam side and you've got a complex as well. You're thinking, oh, I I want to swap sides. Feel free. Um, You know, you can move around as you like, but um, we'll we'll swap over. So um, Adam and Jesus, it doesn't matter which side it is, as it were, it's just these two realities. And there is a contrast, um, a threefold contrast, 15, 16, 17. Um, He's saying, yeah, there's a basic comparison 
the same basic principle works, namely that what is true of the head of the family becomes true for everyone in that family, but um, that's, that's the extent of the comparison. There are some contrasts. Verse 15, the contrast is between the grace of Jesus and the sin of Adam. And essentially what he's saying there, you can kind of read this at your leisure, um, the grace of Jesus is more powerful, more able to give you life and to save you than the sin of Adam was powerful to destroy you. That's essentially what he's saying there. If you think that, wow, that's pretty lethal what happened in Adam's family, that his sin had the capacity to destroy effectively the whole of his lineage, then you need to understand the grace of Jesus is even more powerful to give life. So he's speaking there about the, the capacity, the power of the Son of God who's become one of us to start this new family, his capacity to generate life. And that's more powerful than Adam's capacity to destroy. Verse 16, uh, Jesus' blessing is more expansive in its scope than Adam's curse. See there, nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment following one sin brought condemnation. But the gift, God's gift, God, what God has done in Jesus, followed many trespasses and brought justification. So you've got Adam, and just one sin brings condemnation upon the whole of humanity. And along comes Jesus, and over against the backdrop of a multitude, millions and billions of sins, not just one sin, but billions of them, he's able, nonetheless, to provide blessing. Where in Adam, after one sin, this curse with Jesus, despite there being countless sins, there is now blessing. So you've got uh, the grace of Jesus is mightier than the uh, sin of Adam, verse 15. You've got the uh, blessing of Jesus is more expansive in its scope than the curse brought on by Adam. And finally, in verse 17, Jesus' mercy is greater than Adam's misery, if we put it like that. If by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Uh, the old Baptist preacher, um, older in the sense that he lived a long time before any of you were born, um, Charles Spurgeon, he put it like this, sin uh, may be a river, but grace is an ocean. Sin may be a mountain, but grace is like Noah's flood, which prevailed over the tops of the mountains, 15 cubits upwards, massively more expansive and larger. The mercy of Jesus, greater by far than the misery that was brought by Adam. So he's, he's wanting to underline there is a basic pattern between these, these two humanities. You are either in the one or the other. And in Jesus, there's, uh, there's so much that means it is just more and better and greater. And so he moves on in verses 18 to 21 to speak about essentially the promise. And the promise is, is really very simple. Uh, God promises that in Adam, that's the humanity to which you belong, which by birth we all belong to, because we're all descended from him, all contaminated in that way. In Adam, here's the promise, in Adam all die. That's what God said right at the very beginning. The day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. That's a promise. Guaranteed by God. That's what happens. And that's repeated here in uh, verses 18 and 19. In Adam, all die. All are under condemnation. It doesn't matter that you can turn around and look at someone else and say, well, I'm a whole load better than that person, and, and conclude, therefore, that actually you're quite reputable, quite upright, quite respectable compared to a whole load of other people in the world. That's neither here nor there. Before Almighty God and His righteousness, you are, you are uh, under condemnation, and death 
uh, is the, the consequence of that, a physical death, a spiritual death, an eternal death. That's a consequence in Adam. And that's what he's pointed to in these verses 18 and 19. Um, <clears throat> and in Jesus, you are justified, you are put right with God, and you have life. Verse 19 kind of expands on it and simply says, in Adam, you are constituted, essentially, a sinner. That's, that's how you're defined by God. You are that. That's the verdict pronounced over you. And that's the reality about your life and your living. It has infected you so that not only are you, you branded as such, you become that. And equally in Jesus, verse 19 underlines, in Jesus, you are constituted right with God and made right with God. As by his Holy Spirit, he begins to remake your life, rebuild your life, restore your life, transform your life until one day you will be finally and fully conformed to the likeness of Jesus. That's what he's doing. You will be made righteous. That's what's going on in these two families, in Adam, in Christ. And that's the, the promise that God makes. In Adam, all die, but in Christ, all who are in him will be made alive. That's the, the, uh, the choice, therefore. Are you just going to stick in the jungle of Adam's family life? Or celebrity or not, are you going to say, get me out of this and get me into the family of Jesus? Verses 20, 21 uh, highlight essentially the, the same truth, but look at it from a slightly different way. And they, they simply underline, you either seek to, to sort out your life and sort out the problems in your world and sort out the reality of sin and sort out the problem of death by law, by obeying the law, or by recognizing that's a fruitless exercise. And you therefore recognize it is my grace. You rely on what God has done for you in Jesus. Uh, the law, he's saying in verse 20, the law was, was never given in order for that to be the means by which you kind of climbed into heaven by means of your, your obedience, by means of your performance. The law was given in order that you might be helped to see actually what your problem is, that you do not measure up. You, you kind of run through the Ten Commandments and I guarantee you will straight off you will recognize, yeah, you know, that's me, and that's me, and that's me. And uh, it's given, he's saying, so that you can see the reality about yourself. That you do not measure up, that, that sin is a problem in your life. Because uh, as, as the law comes in and, and shows you how to live, you maybe plead, you know, no one's perfect. And God says, yeah, that's the problem. You're not. No one is. That's the problem. The law given not to be the means by which you climbed, as it were, into heaven, but rather to, to show you how far short you fall and your need, therefore, of one who will do it in your place. And um, the contrast to that is in Jesus himself. As in Adam, what happens is that death now reigns. No one's got an answer to that. No one can stand up against death in Adam. But in Jesus... Grace reigns. Grace reigns and grace imparts and infuses life. Life that is full, life that is vibrant, life that is eternal, life that is lasting. And it's that life that is imparted there. That's a promise that God makes. You, you are either in Adam and you die, or you are in Christ and you live. You are either trying to do it by law, by, by your performance, or you're relying on what God has done for you in Jesus. And the one brings condemnation and death. The other brings freedom and life. So which is going to be? That's, that's essentially what he's pointing towards. That the whole of the gospel is essentially binary. You are either in the one family, in Adam, or by having received what has been done for you and offered to you in Jesus, having received him into your life, you are in Christ. 
And it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter how much baggage you may have, it doesn't matter how far off piece you have gone in the living of your life, as you receive what God has done for you in Jesus, as you receive him, um, you don't have to understand all that the Bible has taught. You don't have to have a theology degree or anything like that. You just receive this Jesus. Recognize, yeah, he's come to, to do for me what I could never do myself. As you receive that abundant provision that God has made for you in Jesus, then it's freedom and life that you know. And you are either in Adam or you are in Christ. And it is in Christ alone that there is forgiveness. In Christ alone that there is renewal. In Christ alone that there is that victory guaranteed to us even over death. That's the promise that is made to us. See what the problem is, verses 12 to 14. See what the pattern is, the basic pattern. Uh, you are either in Adam, what true of him becomes true of all who are in that family, or you are in Christ. And then the promise, which is it going to be? Are you going to be in Adam still, or are you going to be in Christ? And uh, the, the whole burden of Scripture is to urge you, celebrity or not, to, to say, get me out of this jungle. God says, yeah, um, here is what I've done to get you out, bring you into a new family, a new realm, a new kingdom, and a new life. May God enable us to be found in Christ and to find in him that it is alone in him that life in its fullness is found. Gracious God, uh, thank you for your word. Uh, sometimes slightly complicated for us, just following through all that's going on, but we, we recognize that, yeah, there is a problem in the world in which we live, and we recognize that in our own lives. We put our hands up to that, that we acknowledge that there's a problem, acknowledge that uh, both sin, we don't really have an answer to that, nor death, and we'd love to have an answer to that. And so we thank you for uh, all that we're taught here about what you have done over against the humanity into which we've been born. You've begun a new humanity in Jesus. And we want to just lay hold of him and say, Lord Jesus, risen as you are, the one who is king, uh, we're with you. We want to be in your team, part of your kingdom, on your side. And so we gladly even as we bow before you now, Lord, we receive what you have wrought for us, secured for us, and want simply to make that our own and learn what it is to live with you, our Lord Jesus, as your followers, as your friends, and as part of your family. For your own name's sake, we ask it. Amen. Well, as our closing praise then, we join to sing the, the song, In Christ Alone.
go then in peace to love and to serve the Lord. And together, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.